Okay, thank you. It's a great honor to be invited here, and I'm not giving a great number of talks uh, outside basic research. Uh, I'm basically an ice sheet person. I'll focus on ice sheets and sea level. Incidentally, this picture is from Venice this December, the day when I left. It just illustrates the perils of sea level. No. Let's see. I'll jump right into the issue of, of uh, sea level and ice sheets, starting with sea level. Long term, sea level is primarily controlled by global ice volume. If we go back to the last interglacial, 120 years, 1,000 years back, we had a slightly higher sea level. During the last glacial maximum, we were down 120 meters, and we are up here today. Uh, the remaining potential for sea level rise hidden in the ice sheets is on the order of 60 meters. If we look at the temporal evolution through the last glacial cycle, it's kind of dramatic. Sea level is rarely stable. That's a natural condition on this planet. The Holocene, our present period, is unusually stable, or has been, I would say. During the last deglaciation, from around 20,000 BP until 8,000, we cashed in 110 meters of sea level rise in 12,000 years. And this was driven by a global mean temperature change on the order of six degrees. Could be five, could be six. Nobody knows for certain. It's difficult to calculate, but it's not terribly wrong. This gives us some rates. The average rate of sea level rise during the last deglaciation, uh, where of course conditions were considerably different from today, uh, was on the order of 10 millimeters per year. Uh, during discrete meltwater pulses up to se several centimeters per year. We can actually, from these data alone, define a long-term sensitivity of the ocean ice sheet system. And it's kind of a surprising result. Six degrees change triggered 110 meters of sea level rise, meaning a sensitivity of 20 meters per degree. That since our minds spinning regarding the last century's 0 0.8 degrees. Do we expect 16 meters? No, we don't. Why? It has to do with the configuration of ice sheets and where we are in, in, in time and space. The planet has four ice sheets. Two of them are ephemeral. The Laurentide and the Cordilleran ice sheet, the North American ice sheet complex, and the Eurasian ice sheet complex. They come and go with every glacial, interglacial cycle. And we have two ice sheets that can be regarded as stable. Even Greenland, in one shape or another, seems to survive interglacials, mostly intact. Uh, and we have presently lost the two most sensitive ones. And we did that uh, during a period when insulation was high, they had the southern margins, especially in the case of North America, more than halfway to the equator. So they were an easy prey for, for uh, warming. Uh, we had other factors that ensured their, their demise, such as uh, deeply depressed, isostatically depressed beds, uh, incursion by uh, the sea into interior embayments and so on. So our, sense, our system today is not nearly as sensitive as it was. So we don't expect those uh, rates of sea level rise or that uh, net effect for reasonable amounts of global warming. This is a curve in the latest IPCC report. That's what we are experiencing today. Uh, present rate of sea level is on the order of three millimeters per year. Uh, it's accelerating. It's very illuminating to simply compare this curve to the uh, temperature curve. They're actually, superficially, look, they look similar, but they're actually kind of different. Uh, because if you look at this 40-year plateau when world temperature didn't change appreciably, there is no such plateau in the sea level record. Why? 
of course, because this step changed. The world was warmer here than here. Uh, affected glaciers, they continue to shrink. They are sluggish systems. So there is no reason whatsoever to believe that even if we could somehow halt temperature increase, uh, sea level will continue to rise. There is absolutely no escape from that. It's a question of uh, the rate and the additional risks that are present in the ice sheet system. These are from the latest IPCC report. I will not go deeply into that. I just checked some recent publications to see if there was any drama. Not really regarding the present rates, but there are many articles in the last few years that point to uh, risks of, of high rates of, of sea level rise associated to internal dynamics in ice sheets. Faster flow of outlet glaciers, partial collapses, uh, etc. I'll come back to that. So the, the current pro ruling prognosis is this, three, four decimeters until 2100, uh, and a slightly larger uncertainty. Uh, there are many scientists who now think that this is a little on the low side. Uh, I'll not go deeply into the impacts because I'm not into impacts or, or the human dimension of this problem, but still just briefly outline uh, and, and subdivide it into, call it three effects or relationships or possible impacts. Most of the world's coastline is uh, unpopulated or sparsely populated with a dispersed kind of settlement illustrated by this a uh, photo from an Inuit settlement on Victoria Island. One meter of sea level rise will place the new shoreline under his upturned boat here. And I think that the response to sea level rise in a place like this will simply be that the next cabin is located 10 meter upslope. So there is no drama for much of the world's shorelines. But of course, in green, we have regions and there may be more such regions. This was quick and dirty work. Uh, where uh, uh, in economically developed countries we have built uh, phenomenally expensive infrastructure close to sea level and mega cities like New York rising right out of the sea. Here the problem can be spelled cost. It will be incredibly costly to, to deal with uh, rising sea level. Nobody is likely to die, but uh, it, it's a... It, a year with economic depression and swine flu, I don't think that society looks forward to great costs for adaption. The focal points are simply the river deltas, the densely populated river deltas around the planet, because a rising sea level simply aggravates an already existing problem. Deltas are dynamic features. Sediment is supplied, it's dumped on the sea floor, they build right up to sea level, they are dynamic in that sense. Uh, delta regions sink because of the weight on the crust of the earth and uh, only sedimentation make them keep pace with that sinking so that they again are built up to sea level. In many of the large river systems we build dams upstream which reduce the sediment supply and the Nile Delta is already feeling that. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, diversion of water for irrigation purposes like this completely artificial oasis in Egypt uh, means that you can have uh, even less uh, erosion in the stream channel and supply of sediments. So uh, they will go down these deltas and that will hurt living conditions for people there. And so, uh, areas involved are massive, there is no way to artificially hinder the incursion of, of the sea. So the deltas will be the focal points. Turning to ice sheets, quickly. Uh, it's very difficult to convey what an ice sheet really is. This is my best shot at it. Uh, it's a picture from the helicopter above Allen Hills in Antarctica. What you see are the two most uh, inward located noon attacks. It's, it's an ocean of ice, two, three kilometers thick, occasionally four. 
it's 3,000 kilometers to the next coastline, the width of the United States. Immense volumes, summer temperatures minus 25, it's not easy to melt this guy. Changes in ice sheet and glacier volume can be broadly categorized in two types, through melting, pretty well understood, to some extent predictable, well treated by IPCC, and secondary, through partial collapses of ice sheets. We know from the geological record that this has happened in the past frequently, but it has not been observed because of our short observation period. Poorly treated by IPCC. Furthermore, I think it's very meaningful to simply divide the glacial system into three. Other glaciers, Greenland and Antarctica, that's completely sufficient for our treatment. These are three entirely different systems. Never say that the ice sheets are melting or collapsing or anything, because we have three glacial systems on the planet. They have completely different properties. They differ by two orders of magnitude in size or, or storage capacity. One is completely melting dominated, one is completely carving dominated, and Greenland is right in the middle, in between. Different response times, and this is just my own personal judgment of the risk for partial ice sheet collapses. Come back to that. Extreme ice sheets events. Uh, there is actually a, a causal chain or functional chain of, of uh, drastic events. We have ice, uh, ice shelf collapses such as the Larsen ice shelves. In itself, these do not affect sea level because ice is already floating. But they unbuttress ice streams, may be involved in partial collapses through switching on of ice stream flow, which uh, what do you call it, collapses interior areas. And if we get a rapid retreat of the grounding line on a reverse sloping bed, we are in even, even deeper trouble. So, so internal ice sheet dynamics are important. Only the upper surface is in contact with the climate system. Uh, so we get a direct response on the melting system, which for all practical purposes is surface melting. But uh, shape, flow, uh, volume of ice sheets are very much determined by basal conditions. The bed can be frozen, it can be thawed, and that means differences in thicknesses and flow. So, and this is a system that operates partly independent of climate. These risks uh, with, with uh, uh, ice stream, acceleration and surges were identified well before the, the general awareness of the climate problem. So we have a, a risk that is there even without any climate change, but it's very hard to quantify. Ice streams. Uh, looking at, at a bigger picture, uh, I'll try to bring home a few important things here. This is just the surface slope on Antarctica. This is the organization of fast uh, and slow flow. This is a subglacial topography. This is a comparison of the organization of the ice sheet with the northern hemisphere ice sheets. Uh, very important for the discussion on tipping points is the fact that any realistic large ice sheet uh, is composed of a multitude of ice drainage basins, almost like a river network. For topographical and other substratum geothermal reasons, any tipping point, if there are such, will be individual for each catchment. And the system with many tipping points at different levels will behave as a system without tipping points for practical purposes. So you can probably point to a vulnerable region such as this part of West Antarctica and say what thresholds should not be passed but you can never find such a figure for the entire ice sheet because it's a dispersed system. And when we look, I have done this exercise for, for the Laurentide ice sheet. We could come, count roughly 20 major catchments. And what happens if you really get the ice going and spew it out in the ocean in one catchment is actually that you deplete the source areas for the adjacent catchment. So the net increase will not be that large. So, there are both positive feedbacks, uh, which are well known and well treated in liter recent literature, but there are also some negative feedbacks in the glacial system that puts a break on these catastrophic collapses. 
advection of cold ice uh, to lower areas are important. When a surge or a fast flow event is triggered, ice thins, cold ice is brought in closer contact with the bed, geothermal gradient steepens, more heat is conducted to the surface, and the bed refreezes and puts a break on the flow. And there are a host of other uh, negative feedbacks, not as much treated in the recent literature. So uh, the risk for partial collapses is there, but they are, can, can be expected to be kind of slow motion collapses because there are breaks in the system. We know that they existed in paleo ice sheets. The uh, basal thermal and the hydraulic control on them is terribly complex. Uh, they are not directly triggered by climate, but at least in places where you have a lot of, of marginal surface melting, like Greenland, you can get bed lubrication through uh, surficial meltwater, and this may increase the risk, or it's very likely that it increases the risk. Uh, hard to put numbers on. And in general, we cannot strictly calculate the risk of magnitude of such events. A year or two ago, I simply made a back of the envelope calculation. Uh, I took, uh, let's see if I, yes. My favorite candidate for a risk area, which is Wilkes Basin, um, and did the numbers. It's large, it's, the size is roughly Sweden. You can make some assumptions regarding pre and post collapse ice profiles. I estimated the duration of 500 years, partly from inferences from the geological record, that that's a likely time frame, uh, and came up with half a meter of sea level in 500 years, meaning an additional one decimeter per century for per event. That's back of the envelope. It can be wrong, but it's getting there somehow. Greenland is a rather stabilized sheet for simple topographical reasons because the sea has very limited access to the interior and when, if it thins and shrinks, the bed will uh, rise out of the sea more or less. Uh, but it's vulnerable to melting, which is exactly what goes on right now. Uh, in a warmer world, it will slowly melt away, but likely without massive drama. I regard the risk of partial collapses as low. Antarctica is a different beast. It must be subdivided in East Antarctica, which is almost immune to realistic amounts of warming. But we still have the dynamic risks in places such as Wilkes Basin. West Antarctica uh, takes quite a lot of warming to actually achieve any melting here. Here you can get melting. Uh, but bed topography is favorable for partial collapse events, which has been known for a very long time. May result in significant mass loss on the time scale of several centuries. So where are we heading? I didn't dare make a graph, but I'll try to speculate based on my general knowledge. And, and uh, I regard it as very unlikely that, that uh, sea level rise will be uh, in, in the low end of, of, of the IPCC estimates. We have a current rate that is, and it's very likely to be at that rate or higher. The question is just how much higher. Uh, I think increased melting of smaller glaciers. We should remember that the total reservoir of ice in smaller glaciers is only half a meter of sea level, and we'll not get rid of everything. Mountain ranges are high occasionally. Uh, we may double this value, give us six millimeters. Uh, I think it can be defended at the end of the period. Uh, I have allowed, actually, instead of just saying that these collapses are not terribly likely, I simply said that two slow motion collapses start tomorrow and did the numbers for that. Uh, because then we have somehow accounted for, for this risk. And uh, time average this plus these two collapses, the higher values, in 100 years, 85 centimeters. I wouldn't go much higher than that. That requires such a catastrophic uh, temperature increase that sea level may be the smallest of our problems. Finally, or almost finally, uh, this is an old graph. I did it two years ago because I think it's meaningful to compare these risks. They are essentially geohazards. 
uh, with other geohazards or more known character. You can choose many things to have on the axis, but I think for humans, predictability is terribly important. Uh, and somehow the time dimension must be addressed. Uh, the color scheme is such that here is basically business as usual, may require some planning. Uh, nothing drastic happens, it's not terribly costly. Red, that's where people die. Somewhere here, uh, you can save people but not infrastructure. This is high cost, something like that. It's not uh, heavily formalized, but uh, earthquakes and tsunamis have a very low predictability. We may say where, but never when. Uh, volcanic eruptions, especially the globally affecting, may, there may be some predictability. Severe storms, we get a few days of warning, whether it's a tropical storm or, or a mid-latitude storm. We can save people, but we cannot save the forest, for example, or infrastructure. Sea level rise caused by melting is highly predictable, very, very predictable. Uh, it's fairly slow. It will not cause great harm. It, it will be in terms of money. Sea level rise caused by collapse events is more of a problem because of the very low predictability. But we can at least get further uh, with what those events would be like if they are triggered or if they start. Finally, just to remind that partial ice sheet collapses has happened. This is a bed uh, in a place called Dubont area uh, in Western Canada. It affected, it's, this is a fast flow thing, a partial collapse of an ice sheet created this 8,000 years ago. It affected an area the size of Sweden south of Stockholm. Thank you.